Um, I actually gave this talk for the first time just yesterday. Uh, the version that I gave yesterday was in an hour and 45 minutes. I don't have an hour and 45 minutes tonight. I have 15 minutes. Uh, so I decided to throw away all of my slides, and this is just going to be a talk at the prompt. I'm going to start my talk with a quiz. Actually, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to write a little bit of code. And I'm not going to use any text editor. I'm just going to use the shell because I don't want to start any sort of war with like, you know, what editors people like to use. Huh? I do use Joe, actually. All right. Now, most people know what this is going to do, barring any syntax errors, which is possible given that I'm writing code in front of a couple hundred people. Um, but it's going to say, hello world. I think everybody can assume they know that's going to happen, or that's what's going to happen when they do that. Now, what happens when I do this? Now, unless you read PEP 332 from 2004, I'm guessing most of the people in this room don't know what's going to happen. It's sort of a trick question. So what it's going to say, oh, my window's not quite the right size. Now you can actually see this. It's going to say, can't find main in dot. OK, so what does this mean, that PY? It's sort of a teaser. I'm just going to cheat a little bit here, put that in there somewhere. I'm going to run the same thing. Now what do you expect to happen? Hello world. OK, this is sort of surprising. I did not expect this to happen the first time I saw it work. Now, Python also happens to have a zip import subsystem. It means you can import files from zips. So let's do something a little bit fun here. OK. Who thinks this is going to work? Hands, you think, think it'll work? Works. OK, cool. Now, we know that, um, at least with bash scripts, uh, We know that we can do things like this. That works. Sort of a surprising thing with Python, though, is that it doesn't care if it's a Python script or a zip file. But this actually works. Now, what is hello world? You know, it's got a hash bang at the top of it. But it's actually a zip file. It just says it's got you know, these 22 extra bytes at the beginning, which is the hash bang that I just put in there. But this is a zip file. And this opens up some interesting possibilities. So now, you, know, you could be asking yourself, like, why would I even care? Like, what is the point of putting a hash bang at the beginning of a zip file if I can just put it at the beginning of my Python script? Well, that's actually really the point of my talk. And given that my talk is completely in bash, there's my first slide. This is the title of my talk. Um, and I'm going to talk about PEX. Actually, JJ asked a question earlier about why aren't you using PEX. We don't actually, ha we haven't really ever talked about um, a lot of the things that we open source at Twitter. So here's my first opportunity to tell you about PEX, which is something that we've built to solve this sort of problem. So I'm going to first start by um, creating virtual env, also something else that uh, was talked about. Everybody should you know, know about virtual env, source bin activate. I know it's suboptimal, but we do this. So you can pip list. You'll see all the packages that are in this virtual env. It's completely empty. Um, and what I want to do is I want to write a Flask application. So this is a little bit harder to code without a text editor, but I'll give it a shot anyway. If somebody notices a typo, please tell me. Uh, by the end of this talk, I'll have implemented Hello World so many times. All right, looks good? OK. Now, of course, this is not going to work because I don't have Flask yet. Now, I'm in a virtual env. I could always pip install Flask if I wanted to, uh, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to use some of Twitter's libraries. And I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, shout out to some of Twitter's libraries. Um, these are some of the ones that we've uh, uploaded to the cheese shop. Um, now, uh, in the previous talk, you heard about um, service discovery, for example. So we uh, have open sourced um, our version of service discovery. We have something called server sets. Uh, we have an implementation of those in Python um, that work with Kazoo. Shout out to Ben. I think he was here. Um, 
And uh, we also have, I think, a Twitter common uh, metrics library somewhere. It might not be open. Yeah, there it is. We have a Twitter common metrics library. Very simple in spirit to what uh, they were talking about before with the USQ metrics. Uh, similar format, even. Uh, that's something that you can use if you choose. But um, the purpose of this talk is to actually talk about uh, Twitter common Python. There's one thing that I'm going to allow myself to pip install here. And hopefully, Twitter's network actually functions. OK, great. Fabulous. So Twitter common Python has this utility that comes with it that's called PEX. It's a console script that comes along with it. And because I made my font so gigantic, it sort of wraps around. But it says PEX builds a Python executable file based upon a given specification, sources, requirements, their dependencies, and their options. So let's try this out with Flask. OK, that was really fast. Um, I happen to have some of those dependencies already cached. But what it poops out is it's going to give us this flask.pex. Now, what is this flask.pex? It's an executable file. And it just drops us into a Python interpreter. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that I can actually import flask. That's pretty cool. If I do a pip list, I'll see that flask isn't actually in my virtual M. So this is certainly within this file. Uh, but I can take uh, this flask.pex, and I have my you know, flask hello world. And I can run it. So this PEX file is, in effect, a Python interpreter that I can use to run Python. And uh, we can validate that. I'm not going to use link to curl. And validate that this actually functions. Cool beans. So now, you know, I just said dash r flask. You know, say I need a, an older version. I need you know, flask older than 0.10 because there's some bug in the latest version. Uh, I can certainly I can write a flask that pex. Uh, alternately, I don't even need to spe uh, specify a pex file at all. I can just um, terminate the command line and run it that way. You know, this might take a little bit, bit of time because that's going to pull down different dependencies. But otherwise, it's still going to run it. So you can actually, within the same shell, run two different versions of flask perfectly happily. It really doesn't care. Um, another thing that pex will support is actually supports entry points. So um, have any of you used Fabric before? Uh, Fabric is a distributed SSH tool. Um, I'm sure many of you have used it. I happen to know that the entry point for the Fab tool is in Fabric main. Uh, I can just dump this out. So now I have this Fab tool. And it is, it is Fab. It is the code from Fabric, uh, but it's self-contained. So it says I don't have any Fab files. So in the spirit of doing Hello World, I'll create a Fab file. And fair enough, I can do fab hello. And it works. So what actually are these PEX files? So they're just zip files. And if you look at the top of this fab thing, it just has a hash bang uh, like you'd expect. But inside, it's just a zip file. Uh, it's a zip file with a very, very carefully constructed main.py. Um, it's got this little bit of PEX info in here, which describes a little bit about the dependencies that are uh, necessary to run it. But then otherwise, it has all of these, um, the eggs that have been produced by, that would have been produced otherwise by um, virtual env. So uh, PEX itself can be built this way. No reason. Uh, it's part of Twitter common Python. Uh, the entry point is uh, not fabric, but Twitter common Python bin PEX main. And just create a PEX.PEX. Uh, again, I haven't really put anything in this virtual env. I can deactivate the virtual env. Fair enough. It still works. So now, uh, if you have a PEX file, um, you can always just uh, drop into an interpreter in its environment. No big deal. Um, now, if you want to actually know what's going on underneath the covers, you can do PEX verbose. And I, ha I still have that fab uh, sitting around. And if you scroll up, it'll just spit out a lot of the things it's doing. It inspects your uh, site packages, makes sure that it's scrubbing those for anything that you've installed globally to make sure that there aren't uh, conflicting versions. Um, it goes through, resolves all the dependencies, makes sure that they're, they are there. In this particular case, I'm building um, dependencies that are OS X specific. So if I wanted to copy this fab binary to a Linux box, it wouldn't actually work. Um, but it, it just sanitizes the environment, um, starts the things, sets up a Python path, and then actually executes. Now, 
There's a bunch of other uh, interesting things you could do. You could say turn on profiling. Um, you know, for free, you can just get a profile of what Fab just did. Uh, mostly, it's going to just be decompressing the zip file. Um, but in practice, Twitter doesn't actually use pex.pex. This is just a utility that happens to come with um, Twitter Common Python. Uh, in practice, we use a tool called Pants. It's a build tool that we've built at Twitter. And I think it was Arthur C. Clarke that once said that any sufficiently large organization can't not roll its own build tool. And so Twitter, like <laughs> Google and Facebook, uh, has built its own. And in fact, Pants very much resembles um, Google's Blaze tool, which they have not open sourced. Um, Facebook has a tool called Buck, which is uh, used for building Android and Java projects. Uh, Pants is essentially our version uh, of that. Um, and uh, Simeon said before that I worked on the Aurora team. Um, so the Aurora team is, uh, so Aurora itself is a service scheduler built on top of Mesos. Uh, it's very useful for running um, services uh, in, a, in infrastructure, uh, just like they were talking about at Yelp. Um, that has now been open sourced. Um, and the only reason that I'm bringing this up is that uh, it actually uses pants. So, um, I'll just clone it to give you uh, a view of that. But um, you might be asking yourself, like, why would you build your own build tool? Um, and really, the reason that we did it is, uh, like many bigger companies, you, they tend to have monorepos. And really, the goal with Pants was to build modularity into our monorepo. Um, so you may have a gigantic source tree uh, with you know, thousands and thousands of directories. However, uh, within that, within that um, source tree, there's logically a bunch of different modules and packages that have fairly well-defined boundaries between them. And so this is just a tool that speaks that language of moduli modularizing um, these repositories. So if we go into this directory that I just, it's on GitHub, uh, there's a little script in there called pants. And if you run this, it's just going to download virtual env, and it's just going to bootstrap itself. So pants actually builds itself um, because it speaks pex. Um, it doesn't use uh, the pex utility like I was talking before. However, it uses all the same libraries. It uses Twitter Common Python to build these things. Um, and so I'm going to continue to let this um, go on and do its thing. And I'm not going to spend really any time talking about Pants, but I'll say why we have Pants specifically for Python. Um, and one important thing is that Pants is actually multi-interpreter and it's multi-platform. And this is really important for us um, because if we are building these PEX files, um, and this is how we actually distribute all of our Python applications to production, um, if we are going to be building these PEX files, we want them to be built in a way that works on multiple different, um, works on multiple platforms. And so Pants happens to know that I'm running on OS 10, but I need to be targeting Linux. So if it's going to be building a PEX file, to both Lincoln OS 10 eggs and Linux eggs. Now, of course, it might have to go out to a remote server to acquire those eggs, but it can uh, certainly do that. Now, I won't really go into, into pants, but you know, you can do pants full list uh, once you have your pants binary. And it's just this is our repository for um, for Aurora. It's really split into two separate projects. Um, there's uh, Thermos and Aurora itself. Um, so Aurora is half Java and half Python. Um, it's probably about 30,000 lines of Python. Most of the client stuff and the executor stuff uh, is written in Python. But you can go and take a look at it. But um, at the very leaves of all these directories, you have build files. They're kind of like make files. Um, I can you know, just take a look at one of them specifically, just to give you an idea. Um, but You've just got these atoms, these Python libraries that describe sources, they describe their dependencies, and Pants, all it does is, is manipulate these sorts of things. So, um, and it's got test suites, but the, the difference is that when you use Pants to talk to targets, it's just going to uh, union up all of these dependencies and essentially build virtual environments for every single individual target, um, and then spit out PEX files should you ask uh, to do it. Um, so, I'm running low on time, so uh, what I'm going to do is leave the rest of it up um, to questions. So if you have specific questions for me about uh, this infrastructure or about any of the projects that we've open sourced, um, now's a great time to ask. So thanks.
Um, so the question is, is the hour and a half version of my talk online? It is not yet. Uh, the, I gave the talk yesterday. Uh, this week is Hack Week at Twitter. Um, and one of the themes of this week, or this quarter's Hack Week is education. So instead of hacking on something, I decided to create a course. Um, so that course references some internal uh, stuff. Um, but I've talked to Rob. I'm going to record a version of that that's purely based upon the open source stuff, like the Aurora repository. And I hope to publish a version of that soon. Um, so thanks for asking. The question is, what is the difference between PEX and Wheel? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so inside of PEX files, there are uh, multiple eggs. And I see uh, eggs and wheels as being much more similar to each other. Um, so in fact, I really want wheel support for eggs. Um, or sorry, wheel support for the for PEXs. Um, but uh, really, PEX is in execution format. So it's more like distributing an entire virtual environment. Uh, whereas the wheel is more um, interested in uh, a particular uh, subproject or a particular dependency, um, but they're definitely related. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Would you say that PEX is, is more like a Java WAR file? Um, I'm not as familiar with. Uh, okay, I get a thumbs up from John back there, who's familiar with both. So yes, I would say that a PEX file is similar to a Java WAR file. <laughs> OK, if there are no more questions, I'll be around afterwards. Feel free to ask me questions about both PEX and Aurora. I'll be happy to answer those offline. Thanks.